Washington's Clear Thinking Headquarters. The Morning Majority, 5 to 9 on 630 WMAL. 637 on WMAL. Brian Neiman, Mary Catherine Hamm for the Daily Caller in the house this morning. Pleased to be joined now by KT McFarland, Fox News National Security Analyst. A lot of the conventional wisdom, KT, is that, you know, the U.S. now has leverage to work against Pakistan to say, hey, you need to shape up. I think even you said that uh, last time we, we talked. Mm-hmm. But I want, do you still think that's true? Because this relationship doesn't seem to be going very well, especially the fact that we still haven't spoken with bin Laden's widows. Right. Um, the Pakistanis are saying, hey, you know, don't blame us. You know, hey, you know, he, if he was here for five years, you, you didn't find him either. <laughs> I, I, where is this relationship today? Is it worse off than it was a week ago? Um, I think it's, it's in limbo. Uh, you know, the one thing you have to accept about Pakistan is, is what one of their editorials in, in Islamabad said, in New Delhi said, that either you accept the fact that the Pakistanis didn't know, in which case they're a failed state, or they did know, in which state they're a rogue, in which case they're a rogue state. And the United States, I think, needs to have, as I said last week, two conversations. A public conversation of happy talk, mm-hmm. but a private conversation of that, you know, this game doesn't go, keep going on. You either are with us in the sense of going after the Taliban, um, forsaking the Haqqani network, joining us and wiping out the safe havens, we'll do the drones, you do the ground, um, or you don't. And if you don't, there's significant consequences. Well, they don't seem to be with I mean, they've outed two CIA agents right. in the last couple of weeks as well. Well, I think they've gotten a certain amount of internal, um, you know, that that's a CIA thing, that's an ISI thing. Um, but we need to have a, and you know, we have to be willing to walk away, I think, from Pakistan. Why do we need Pakistan? We need Pakistan for two things. One, we're scared of their 100 nuclear weapons, and two, we need them for Afghanistan. But there are other ways, I think, now to go after Afghanistan, and that's to go either through the Pakistanis to the Taliban or directly to the Taliban. And let the Taliban know you have three options here. With bin Laden gone, that personal connection between Omar um, Mullah Omar and bin Laden is gone, and Al Qaeda and the Taliban, they don't get along on a lot of issues. So the excuse for having that close relationship is gone. Secondly, the Pakistanis um, have given safe harbor to the Taliban, to parts of the Taliban. But parts of that Taliban have been seriously degraded by the drone strikes. We have seen in the last week in Kandahar the Taliban spring offensive. It went well initially, and then it went very badly mm-hmm. for them. So they're degraded. And the other point is that, that, you know, Hillary Clinton said this a week ago, nobody paid any attention to it. She said it's time for the Taliban to come to the negotiating table and forsake their ties with al-Qaeda. Petraeus said something similar in an interview this week to the AP. So what we're sending them a signal is to the Taliban, we'll negotiate with you now. You know, you have to do certain things, you have to lay down your arms, you have to go along with the Constitution, but we're willing to negotiate. And I can't believe that the Taliban aren't willing at some level to negotiate, because they've got to look at al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda's taken them down this road. Al-Qaeda is diminished, it's weak, the personal connection is gone. The Americans have degraded the Taliban. Now, maybe the Taliban can say, well, we'll wait it out, America's eventually leaving. But at what price? And so I think it's worth trying to go directly to the Taliban or go through the Pakistanis and have them help us go to the Taliban. Well, and we hear this a lot about the Middle East, but the Pakistani government is having a double conversation as well, where they have to be not so friendly to America, to their right. people, and then, you know, have a back channel talk with us. Uh, how do you sort of overcome that? Is there hope within that population that they could, you know, actually be supportive? And then if they're not, what are the serious consequences? What do our politicians actually have the ability to do? You know, the, the serious consequences, um, I mean, can they do it? Can they pull it off? That's really up to them to say. Yeah. You know, my guess is that what we're seeing is the end of a civilian rule. In Pakistan is like a teeter-totter. You know, they, have, they go from civilian rule, and it's incompetent and corrupt, and then the military takes over. And the military rules for a while, but then they really push it too far. And so then the civilians, well, they want their chance at it, so it goes back and forth. And Pakistan has done that about seven times since its founding. My guess is we're probably getting to the end of the, of the high part of the civilian leadership. Um, what are the consequences for the United States? Well, where's our strategic interest in that area? We're worried about the nuclear weapons that we want out of Afghanistan. If we can find another way to get out of Afghanistan by negotiating with the Taliban, 
by um, by you know training up the Taliban forces, that gives us an out. And if we really wanted to cut and run, we've got the out now, which is the death of Bin right. Laden. Um, and so, really, it's the only you worry about the hundred nuclear weapons. Now, how do you deal with that? Well, we've just shown that we have the ability to do um, special ops, covert operations, and deep in the heart of Pakistan. Secondly, we could go to the Indians and form a more uh, a closer strategic relationship, which we have historically never had with India. We've had economic relations, but we've never had a strategic military relationship with them. That's Pakistan's arch enemy. Where are those hundred nuclear weapons? most likely pointed to, they're not pointed at us, they're pointed at the Indians. Well, what about this report that there may have been a secret deal between Pervez Musharraf and President Bush saying Mm -hmm. essentially that, hey, if we find bin Laden in the country, we can go in there and take care of it, and you can, you know, you won't do anything, and you can deny the fact that you even knew that we were going to go in there. You know, there probably was an implicit understanding of that, but I doubt if it was, you'll ever get proof of that. Right. I, here's what I think is going to happen in Pakistan in the next week or two or three. We are going to find in that treasure trove of information a smoking gun that leaks right. bin Laden to somebody in the ISI mm-hmm. or in the military. And when that happens, then I think it's very difficult for the American public to continue to give them $3 billion a year. So I would say that not only do we have leverage with Pakistan, but we have a very narrow window to exploit that leverage. Because once that happens, it's over. What about this guy on the airplane that was flying from Chicago to San Francisco, a Yemeni, uh, had a Yemeni passport mm-hmm. and didn't have a lot of money, had, had no luggage, had a couple of checks postmarked, were like $13,000, um, and you know started uh, trying to get into the cockpit uh, allegedly, he thought it was the bathroom, but still was yelling Allah Akbar. Yeah, uh, just just some random events. Well, that's what you worry about. I mean, you know, this is but all of our intelligence officials have warned about this. I mean, I've spent a lot of time talking to Michael Hayden, former head of the CIA, about this, and others. They worry about the lone wolf because that's a guy you don't see coming. What you know, Al Qaeda now is going to. Several things are going to happen. Al Qaeda is going to want Al Qaeda Prime headquarters. You know, um, Sawahiri. They're going to want to try to do something really big to show that they're still relevant, that it's not, but that they can survive the death of the founder. The, the franchises around the world, they're all competing with them to assume the mantle of bin Laden. So they're all going to try to do something. So you've got to assume that anything that's in the pipeline, they're going to activate. Whether they can succeed or not is a separate question, but they'll activate it. And secondly, that all the lone wolves out there are going to be recruited as much as they can. Most of them are now recruited from cyberspace, where they, they're, they're kind of unbalanced and crazy anyway, and they find al-Qaeda in cyberspace, and that's mostly the Yemeni connection. And then they go off and do, you know, not n- necessarily very well, <laughs> yeah, right. but, you know, <laughs> but they make a try at it. And I think you'll see a lot more of that effort. And what the worry is that it's somebody who's in the United States legitimately. Their target, as we've seen so far with the leaked treasure trove information, their target remains Americans, America, get somebody on the inside who carries an American visa or passport who can travel within the United States and then let them do it. You know, I mean, recruiting in cyberspace, there's something called Inspire Magazine, yep. done by um, Al-Aki from Yemen. And one of the leading articles is how to make a bomb in the kitchen of your mom. <laughs> okay, so they're going for the homegrown guys who are going to go into the kitchen, put some stuff together, buy a little fertilizer yep. at Home Depot, and try to blow themselves up. All right, KT. Good to talk to you, as always. Appreciate your time. And congratulations, Mary Catherine. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Remember, see you later. Married, right? I mean, yes. That's what the congratulations are. <laughs> yes, okay, just making sure. I was like, no, 